All right. Barbara, I see your face. Do you want to have opening prayer for us? Okay. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity for us to be able to get together this evening. Please open our minds to the studies and help us to learn all that we can about your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. Well, sure. tonight uh, we're going to study one of my favorite Bible prophecies because it's kind of like the, um, the one of the combinations that unlocks the rest of Daniel and also Revelation. Let's see. And of course, you guys know that uh, I'm Eddie Armstrong and uh, Larry's on there with us and Charlie, the one with the corny humor. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to pass the uh, the uh, baton to Larry next week. He's going to do Daniel chapter 3, and uh, that'll be an exciting one, too. Um, I do use the King James Version. I just want to make a note to, to you guys. When I send out the Word document, you can just click on the, on the verse, and it'll take you right to the Bible verse. So that's an easy way to, um, to go to your Bible. Uh, also, a reminder, if you have questions, please feel free to stop and ask, uh, stop me and ask me. And if it's one we can do pretty quick, I'll answer it. If, it, if it's one to take a longer answer, we may that defer that to the next time or to the lesson that addresses it. Uh, you can send questions to Charlie, Charlie Hayes, over the chat screen, and he will collect questions there. Okay, let's do a quick overview of last week. We'll remember that Babylon takes Jerusalem captive and destroys the city and the temple. Now, just think about that. Which temple was this? Yeah, do you remember Solomon's temple? Or Solomon's temple, yeah. Yeah, Solomon's temple, and that was a, a, a breathtaking building. It was destroyed completely. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then in the third year of the reign of Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And that was in the uh, 605 B.C. And I'm trying to find my pointer here. Okay, there we go. Um, then according to Jeremiah 25, verses 8 through 11, the children of Israel would be in captivity for 70 literal years. Now, we're going to come across a 70-year prophecy later. You'll see that 70 years uh, mentioned again. Uh, then Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, Azariah chose God's path, and they were determined to, be, to do God's will. And as a result, they were found 10 times better than the other wise men. This was their Hebrew names, and they were changed to Belteshazzar, Adrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that's really, most of us can say that a lot easier because we're more familiar with their captivity names. So that's a high-level high view of the last. Isn't it, funny? Isn't it funny? The only one we keep is Daniel, and then they, all the rest of them, we use Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, yeah. that's true. It's a lot easier to me. To, <laughs> no, that's sorry. Right. It's it's a lot easier for me to say those than Hannah and I and Michelle and Azariah. You hardly ever hear them. Mention. It is. But then you think we'd yeah. say Belteshazzar instead of Daniel. <laughs> yeah. Right. So uh, the king wanted to really incorporate the the when they when he took people captive, he wanted to change them. So he he changed their names. And how would you like to be named? Uh, have your name, which is uh, God is my judge, that's what Daniel, to Belteshazzar, which means prince of Baal, false god. But despite these names that were tagged to them, uh, they stayed firm to God. And sometimes names will uh, separate, or, uh, but not in the case of these four young men. Now, they're young at this point. Now, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about tonight, so you'll kind of see this develop as we go along. First of all, Nebuchadnezzar has a very disturbing dream. He can't recall it, and he's desperate to know its meaning. 
the wise men are called in to tell him the dream and its inter interpretation. Now, the, the wise men are the astrologers, the soothsayers, the palm readers, all those type of guys, but they can't do anything. And I'm going to label them tonight with the name fakers, okay? <laughs> You'll see why as we move along. Daniel and his friends uh, take, uh, take this, what's going on to their God, and God reveals to Daniel a very dramatic dream, and not only the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, but its interpretation. And Daniel tells the king, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he's made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. And this prophecy will show us the history of the world before it happens right down to our day and the return of Christ. So it comes through our time and on to uh, the return of Christ. Now, the purpose of Daniel 2 is to let us know that there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And we saw that last week in Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he re his secret, he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So it would be wise for us to listen to his prophets, right? Because we're, we're actually hearing or seeing what God uh, has revealed and, and what he wants to tell uh, planet Earth. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is exciting. I think you're very right. This is something that we should pay attention to because it is one of the leading prophets, as we understand it. Uh, and uh, so there's got, got a lot to say to us. And I wanted to jump in here just before we got into it too much and say this also helped me so much. This right. is one of the prophecies that turned the Bible into uh, <laughs> something random, if you will. That maybe, maybe has some nice words into it. It's something I could have faith in that God actually wrote it. So that's how much I, I like this study. Yeah. Right. Yes, Charlie and I have similar experiences. Uh, I took uh, ancient history in college and I was familiar with these four great monarchs that we're gonna talk about, but not from the perspective of the Bible. <laughs> it was from the perspective of my history professor. So let's see uh, what we have here in Daniel 2. Uh, someone like to read Daniel 2 verse one? I'll read it. Okay. Lori, Corey, <laughs> sorry. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had a had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that he his slept left him. Okay. So a uh, very disturbing dream. Have you ever had a dream like that where you woke up and you were just worried? Well, this one, this one was every was every bit of that. Uh, perhaps he woke up and couldn't go back to sleep. Uh, I've had dreams like that where I couldn't go back to sleep. Of course, it wasn't the type of dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. This conquering king had a dream that was no doubt given to him by the ruler of the universe. Uh, so we'll see what this dream has to say. Okay, someone else like to read Daniel 2, verse 2. I'll read it. Oh. Go ahead. This, is, this is Margie. Okay, Margie. Then, then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. Okay. So the king, this dream so disturbed me so much that he calls in the wise men. They're magicians. And this is not in the good term of, you know, sleight of hand. Uh, they were astrologers. They studied the stars, sorcerers. They, uh, brought, you know, had spirits and the Chaldeans, which were the other wise men in Babylon. Now, this was the A team for the king. These, these guys right here. But uh, let me read this uh, slide to you here. This is from a book called Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. It says, the magicians practiced magic using the term in a bad sense. That is, they employed all the superstitious rites and ceremonies of fortune tellers and casters of nativities, birth dates, and the like. Astrologers were men who pretended to foretell events by the study of the stars. 
And isn't it strange, we still have this group around today. You can find them just about in any state in America or any country. Uh, you've heard of horoscopes, palm readers, et cetera. Uh, I call these the fakers, and we'll see why here in a sec. All right, uh, someone read Daniel 2, verse 3. And the, king the king said, said, Go ahead. and the king said to them, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Okay, so he's anxious to know and we can kind of feel that uh, as he says this, he wants to know the dream that he's forgotten. How many of you guys have dreams during the night and when you wake up in the morning, you just can't remember I do. Sometimes, sometimes I remember and sometimes I don't, but I always right. dream. <clears throat> hardly ever remember my dreams. I re occasionally I'll remember one that, that really sticks with me, but I yeah. wake up and I know I've been dreaming and just don't remember them. Well, the king, this one was, this one really, really bothered me. Okay, someone else read Daniel 2 4. And the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. Okay, thank you, Angela. So they're doing a little, uh, uh, they're trying to impress the king and saying live forever. But they, <laughs> they, they want to say, you know, you tell us a dream and we're going to give you the interpretation. So that'd be real easy to kind of make stuff up, wouldn't it? And that's usually how the fakers work. They want to pull information out of you that they feel like they can create a story. And maybe even a story that you that, that can't be proven. Uh, I would do want to read from this uh, book one more time. Uh, and I promise not to read a lot from uh, this book. I'm sorry, my thing is going on. Uh, and whatever else the ancient magicians and astrologers may have been efficient, they seem to have been thoroughly schooled in the art of drawing out sufficient information to form a basis for some shrewd calculation or of framing their answers in such an ambiguous manner that they would be uh, applicable whatever way the events turned. In the present case, true to their cunning instincts, they called upon the king to make known to them this dream. So they are trying to get this information before they start doing their, their uh, interpretation. But the king answered and said, to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. And if you do not make the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces in your houses. <laughs> shall be made as an ash heap. Ooh, that's some pressure, isn't it? <laughs> so now they're sweating. They got to figure out the dream and its interpretation. Uh, so they try to talk their way out of it. And here's, here's what they say. Uh, verses uh, six and seven, would someone like read that for me? However, if you tell the dream and it is in its interpretation, you shall receive gifts from me, rewards and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and he will give his, we will give its interpretation. interpretation right so they kind of double down <laughs> they say it again maybe you didn't hear us king but you you've got to tell us the dream and then we'll give you the interpretation and, they and, then that, <laughs> and then the king really gets upset and he answers and said i know for certain that you're stalling <laughs> that's what would gain time <laughs> you're stalling because you see that my decision is firm you you know you're about to die if you do not make known the dream to me, there's only one decree for you. <clears throat> for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can give me the interpretation. So this is kind of a test. You got to, even though he forgot it, he says, look, if you can tell me the dream, then I'm going to have confidence that you can give the interpretation. This is why I call them the fakers. <clears throat> the king knows they're stalling. The fakers' true colors are starting to come out. 
the king determines uh, the way to know they can interpret the dream is to get them uh, to tell him the dream. <clears throat> and they, they still try to talk their way out of it. Someone read verse uh, 10 through 11 there, please. <laughs> Chaldeans answered the king and said, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is, difficult, it is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. There is so much <clears throat> wrong with their statement here. There's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Well, we're going to find out there is a man on earth. <clears throat> that man is Daniel. And then they say that uh, the gods don't dwell with flesh. Uh, is does that remind you of another verse found in John? <clears throat> yeah. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Right. Here's a little <clears throat> snippet of uh, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, eventually, Jesus would come and dwell us in the flesh. But I'm going to disagree with you, Eddie. Just okay. I'm going to say that they were speaking a lot of truth here. <laughs> okay. Because this, there isn't a man... And Daniel can't do it. Daniel even say he can't do it. It's ah, oh, good point. <clears throat> yeah. And, and so when he says no one can do it except the gods, well, they're speaking truth as I understand it. They can't do it. It'll take God to do it. Hey, good point. <clears throat> I recant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here. <clears throat> For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men. There was actually killing going on of these wise men, and they were started looking for Daniel and his companions to kill them as well. So let's see what Daniel and his friends did here. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard. Isn't it interesting that Daniel's always making friends with his uh, captors, mm -hmm. uh, just as, as Joseph did. So it's always like my dad said, and I said it last week, bloom where you're planted and be, uh, and be a, uh, good at whatever you do. And you the captain of this, the king's- and, and these guys are, have been removed from their home. And as you, as you were pointed out, the temple was, completely broken down. They stole everything out of the temple. Jerusalem was laid to waste. And here they are away from their home. And instead of holding a grudge, as you will, against their captors, he makes friends with the captors. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you had gone up someone else, Deborah? Did you say something? I saw Deborah's name pop up. No. I've got my <laughs> I've got my screen set up so if someone talks or make a noise, I can uh, see who it is. <laughs> okay, so uh, <clears throat> the captain of the king's guard had gone out, gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? And then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So evidently the king says, go kill them now. And so they started uh, this killing spree. And uh, so Arioch evidently slowed down when he got to Daniel uh, and he told him what, why it was going on. Um, so uh, in, okay, let's go to verse six. Would someone read that? So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Isaiah, his companions. All right. Now, I don't know if you caught this or not, but Daniel went straight to the king. And evidently, since he had been uh, trained for three years, he had certain privileges. He went in for the king and said, hey, give me, give me some time. And the king... Uh, evidently uh, honored Daniel enough to actually stop the killing for a while. Yeah. So Daniel 2, verse 17, someone read that one. 
Oh, that they may no, that going. they might seek mercies from God from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Okay. So <clears throat> they sought the face of God through prayer. Notice Daniel and his three friends are not praying for the interpretation of the dream. They're praying that they might not perish. Uh, God is going to answer it in a way expected, and it will be a witness for thousands of years, even into our time. So uh, God's going to answer their prayer, but not in the way they expected it. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in the night visions. So what did Daniel do next? Bless God of heaven. He blessed God. Yeah, he blessed the God of heaven. He thanked so, God probably. <laughs> yeah. So this dream was revealed to Daniel, and the first thing he does is have a little praise session. He said this. He said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what it is in the darkness and light dwells in him. So the first thing that, and shouldn't we do that when God reveals them to us? Shouldn't we have a praise session and just... Mm -hmm honor God, yeah. and that's exactly what Daniel did. Don't forget to praise God. Uh, what? Uh, so let me move along here. Uh, I wanted to ask the question, what does Daniel's praise reveal about God? We have a whole list of things here. A whole list, a lot. He changes times and seasons, and we'll get into this later in the study. But he removes kings and raises up kings. And we found, you know, Daniel, even though, or not Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar was a fierce conquering king. God had a purpose for what he called his servant, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he gives knowledge to those who have understanding. Reveals deep and secret things and he gives light to the darkness. So it tells us a little bit about Later on in Daniel, when we get to like 10 or 11, we actually mm -hmm. see see behind the scenes a little more. God actually opens the veil a little bit. And, and you see, he says, I'm, I'm going to have to deal with the prince of Persia. And now I'm going to go over and deal with the prince of Greece because, you know, there goes, there's going to be a transition at this time. And he's, right. he is working to set up and move kings around. Yeah, that's right. We uh, as And I want to say this over and over because you'll see it. As we make our journey through Daniel, we'll see that God employs uh, this repeat and expand. Uh, repeat and expand. He'll repeat what he said before, and then he'll expand on it. And I'm sure you'll see it as we move on. But where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? And to man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. That's some very um, powerful words from the book of Job. So Daniel and these three praying companions had these qualities. They feared or respected God. They, they had wisdom and they had departed from evil. Uh, another Psalms 111.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We've heard all that, right? That's a, a, a verse often quoted, but I like the rest of it too. It says, a good understanding of all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. God has always wanted a people that uh, obeyed him. And that's a word that a lot of people have a little hard time digesting. But, but uh, you know, Jesus himself said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Um, so uh, keeping God's commandments is not something you do in order to be saved. It's a result of salvation. You will do out of a new heart and out of love for Jesus. You will want to follow him and do what he commands. Daniel 2, verse 23. We're back into Daniel here. Uh, someone like to read that? 
I thank you and praise you, O oh God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. All right. Thank you, Angela. So we're back to a little more praise. The vision was given only to Daniel. You know, it wasn't given. Uh, it says made known to us the king's demand. But actually, it was only Daniel that got the vision. Sometimes we're in a prayer supporting role. And other times we're the giver of wisdom and blessings. But always remember to bless God in whatever role that you have. All right, moving on to Daniel 2.24. Uh, someone read that one. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king and I will tell the king the interpretation. All right, so he goes to the guy that's in charge of killing everybody, Arioch, and he says, don't destroy the wise men of Babylon. He's talking about the fakers here. He, and like any great men and women of God, when possible, they intercede for others. In this case, it's the fakers. Here we see the character of Christ. I thought of that verse that says, while we were yet sinners or fakers, Christ died for us. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God and through the sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, Charlie once uh, has said, let's not hate the fakers, but see them as a mission field. <laughs> uh, can you name some <clears throat> men of God who interceded for sinners uh, in the past? Moses. Yeah, Moses is a great example. Abraham did the same. Job did the same. If you read the book of Job, it's a fantastic book. And at the end, uh, Job was actually interceding for his friends. And of course, Jesus interceded for all of us uh, who were under the death penalty of sin. Remember, Joseph, then Ari, yeah, go ahead. Joseph interceded for those who tried to kill him. <laughs> his brothers. Yeah, that's right. That's brothers. Right. Charlie, you want to read this uh, verse for us? Sure. Verse 25. Then yeah. Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. All right. So quickly, <laughs> Arioch says, I, I, I come on, say Daniel. This. I want to say this on this. Yeah, notice he's ready to take credit <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For, for this. Yeah. But this is how much trust he has in Daniel. That Daniel's not going to let him down. Yeah, yep. true. Um, and notice Judah. There, you know, the the nation of Israel was divided between Judah and Jerusalem. That will become an uh, important thing uh, later in our studies. As well, you mean Judah and, and Israel? It, I'm sorry, Judah and Israel. Yes. So, what separates the fakers from the people of God? Let me just ask that question. <laughs> what separates the people of God from the fakers? Their character. <laughs> okay. There, one of the things I see, Eddie, is that relationship, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Daniel and his friends demonstrate a relationship with God that's important enough for them that they stand firm to, mm -hmm. to their beliefs and trust in God even though the whole world's been shaken. And right. that, that trust is what the basis for everything that happens as far as Daniel goes from that point forward. It's that firm relationship. Okay. And everyone yes. around them has, has seen that they stand for truth and that they can trust them. Mm -hmm. Very good. Good comments. Uh, Candy, uh, and Candy has said belief. <laughs> belief? Yeah. Belief, yes. Uh, belief... Um, uh, let me play the devil's advocate here a little bit. Uh, do the devils believe and tremble? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they do. They believe. The truth, yeah. So uh, I've always looked at faith and belief uh, in the context of trust. Uh, if you believe God, you're going to trust him because he, he asked for you to trust. As we move over into Revelation, we're going to see that this in Revelation 12, 17, 
there is some characteristics of the people at the end time that makes the dragon or the devil enraged with the woman. We'll find out that that woman represents the church. And this is not a denomination. It's, it's the body of Christ, which can be in any church if they have a relationship with Christ. And went on to make war with the rest of her offspring. And here's their characteristics. They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They testify in their own lives that they are a follower of Christ. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they obey God, obey, uh, obey the Lord. Not of their own doing, but through the blood of Christ. You know, there's a verse that says, uh, it is God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Isn't that interesting? God gives you the desire and then does it for you. Um, wonderful verse there in Philippians. All right, someone like to read Daniel 2, verse 26. The and king, the, king, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Right, there's the question that the king's wanting to know. And then Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. So Daniel reiterates that the wise men uh, cannot declare God's secret. Just like Charlie said, this is a truth. <laughs> it is beyond their abilities. Without God, we're all fakers. And then he contrasts it with, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secret and has made known to the King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head uh, upon your bed were these. And this is where we come to tonight with this great prophecy. We've, this has all been kind of the, uh, in Daniel, the setup around what God is going to reveal to you and me and to the world. And uh, it starts with Daniel 2, uh, verse 29 well, to 30. You, you, had, you had it under a title there, and I thought you were going to emphasize that, that this isn't just for uh, Nebuchadnezzar back then. It's for us because us it's now. the latter days. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Charlie, would you read this uh, couple of verses? Sure. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while, you, while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes, who made known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. Okay. So Daniel's very humble about what God has revealed to him. He says, it's not been revealed to me because I'm, I'm any more wise than anybody else, but for our sakes, and I think that our would include us. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, you, know, you notice that the other wise men would probably go to get there, go, King, because I'm so smart and so wise, I'm going to present to you the answer. And yeah. then he's going humbly. It's not because of me. It's because there's a God who can tell you. Yeah. Uh, so the secrets will do something more than just give facts. It will let us know the thoughts of our heart. Yeah. Uh, so let's, um, let's jump in and see this dream. And he goes on. Uh, Daniel says, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent. You know, today I'd hear the kids say, it was awesome. <laughs> splendor was awesome. Yeah. Uh, stood before you, and its form was awesome. Oh, he said it. <laughs> right. He does say it. Yeah. So, and here it was. Here's how he describes it. He says, the image head was of fine gold, 
its chest and arms of, of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So this is an interesting image, right? Do you notice anything about these metals? Gold, silver, bronze, iron, clay. What do you see? They decrease in value of, uh, from top to bottom. Right. right, absolutely. Obviously too, uh, these are symbols. The head and the fine gold are symbols of something. Something, and chest and arm, arms of silver. Well, will we ever figure that out? Uh, of course we will, but there's more to the story here. Uh, in verse 34 and 35, Daniel says to the king, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Wow. A stone cut out without hands. That must have been supernatural for the king to see. Well, and where does it strike the image? In the feet. Head? It's in its feet, okay? That's going to be important. And Charlie, you were about to say something? Yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> I was going to say, it wasn't, it wasn't made by man, right? That rock was not cut out by man. Uh, mm -hmm. All these other things can be formed by, you know, men can form a head of gold and, but can't to, this rock is not man-made, so. Absolutely, that's important. And then it describes what happened next. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and become like shaft. Do you, do you guys know what shaft is? Yes. If you're on the farm, you know, right? That's Larry? right. It's, yes, wheat chaff, for example, is, is the, uh, the leftovers after you've, harvested the grain and it just kind of blows away doesn't it? it does blows in the sky from the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that there was no trace ever found of them wow that's complete destruction it, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth so there you go this um uh the king kept observing these this image the stone, the stone struck it, destroyed it, filled the whole earth. Uh, and at this point, the king recognizes that that was his dream, but he does not know the, the, um, the meaning. So how do you interpret all this? If that's all we had to go on, it would be difficult to uh, interpret. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that because Daniel's going to interpret it for us. Well, let's look at that. Daniel 2, verse 36 to 38, this is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field or birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and he has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Now the old king's chest probably just was puffed out <laughs> uh, because, uh, hold on folks. Better than a gold medal in the Olympics. I tell you, you're the head of gold. You are number one. You are that head of gold. Yep. Are we wiring? <laughs> okay, now we're good. I'd hate to go out in the middle of this. So yeah, he's thinking, man, I'm this head of gold. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, out. We don't. So already we know the interpretation of the head of gold, right? We didn't. Nobody had to tell us. Daniel uh, tells us through uh, God's revealing of the dream. Here's an important verse to remember when you're interpreting Bible prophecy. It's found in 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but by holy men of God. Who are these holy men of God, by the way? Prophets. Or prophets. Yeah. Yeah. Can you name some of those prophets? 
besides Daniel? <laughs> Jeremiah. Yeah. Moses. Jeremiah. Moses. I Isaiah. David. Yeah. Ezekiel. Micah. We're talking about the prophets of the whole Old Testament spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So just like Daniel, it's the Holy Spirit at work in these holy men of God. And uh, so it indeed does not come by the will of men, but they speak as they're moved by the Holy Spirit. Never any private interpretation. That's why I always get scared when so one one man claims to know all there is to know about interpreting scripture, uh, that that can be scary. Uh, I, I think sometimes it's because they will interpret it and it's based upon some experience they have and it really can't be validated against anything except for their experience. And that you right. get in trouble. Yeah. So if you There's can validate an, against scripture, that's a good place. Yeah. There's an important verse. If you're taking notes, you might want to write this passage down. It's Isaiah 28, 9 to 10. It says, whom will he or God teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? So there's the question. Who's God going to teach? And who is he going to make to understand? And here's a, a strange answer. They, those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breast. So who are those? Who has just been weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast? Uh, Baby. Children, right? Yeah. Babies. Yeah. yeah. These are people that can be, uh, can, that want to understand. Children want to understand. And then he goes on to say, for precept must be upon precept line upon line here a little there a little if you study that out what this is telling us is that the best way to interpret bible prophecy is to compare what uh the bible has to say you can find the keys to a lot of symbols in revelation by studying daniel and other prophets just wanted to make that point before we move on so history of starts over 2,500 years ago in 605 BC uh, with uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, here's another important thing that we'll find out as we move along. Prophecies always start with the time in which the prophet gives them and then moves forward. And that's the way it's working here with Daniel. This prophecy is the basis for understanding the timing of the other prophecies in the future. So is there any doubt as to what this head of gold represents? There is none. It must be Babylon. And I would, I'd like to read to you about the majestic Babylon, how great it was laid out in a square, but I'm just going to let you look at an artist's uh, rendition of it. Uh, this was a spectacular place. It's known as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Of course, it lays in ruins now, and God said that no one would ever occupy it again. That's another prophecy that we'll look at later. Uh, and then Daniel 2, verse 39, but after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours. Oh, no. <laughs> then another, a third kingdom of bronze. Oh, no, which shall rule over the earth. So now the proud uh, king's chest is deflated. He's seen that he's going to be taken over by an inferior uh, kingdom. A succession of kingdoms would arise. Uh, so the next kingdom in Daniel 5 28 says, your kingdom, this is Nebuchadnezzar, has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. This is actually in Daniel 5 28 that explains this next kingdom to be the Medes and the Persians. That would take place years later. And then the third kingdom would be the belly and thighs of brass. That's Greece. Daniel 8.21 tells us that the third kingdom uh, was Greece. And uh, let's see, a preview of that in this re. Um, uh, repeat and expand principle. When we get to Daniel 8, we'll see God expanding on these countries and, and talking more about their characteristics. And then there would be a fourth kingdom. 
This kingdom will should be strong as iron in so much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Let me point out something here. Daniel lived up through the time of the Medes and Persians. He was not alive to see Greece come on the scene and who conquered Greece and became the next uh, world empire. Romans. Right. The legs of iron represented the Roman uh, monarchy, uh, uh, the monarchy of Rome. Uh, this was the period of Caesars and puppet kings and the children of Israel were under this rule at, in, uh, at the time of Christ. It was a Roman decree that put Jesus to death. But the dream doesn't stop here. I, and I'm sorry, I'm moving along quickly because I want to make sure we get through. We're pretty close to the end here. It says, wherever you saw the feet, whereas you saw the feet and iron, the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Now, which kingdom is it talking about? It's talking about this kingdom, which was the legs. Um, and, and yet the strength of iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, clay they will mingle with the seeds of men but they will not adhere one to another just as iron does not mix with clay so what happened to rome uh eventually they were divided into the modern uh nations that what we know of as europe today in europe these are uh here's a chart that shows you the 10 toes of this image. Uh, the Franks came in and was one of 10 nomadic tribes that created these countries. The Franks became the, uh, France, the Alamina became Germany, the Lombards became Italy, Suevi, Portugal, Anglo-Saxons, England, the Burgundines, Switzerland, the Visigoths became Strain, Spain, and there were three other tribes that were destroyed later. This is actually prophesied as well, we'll see in a later uh, prophecy. So these also match up with the 10 horns of the beast in Daniel, both Daniel and in Revelation. Uh, just to show you how accurate this was, we know that there's been many people that have tried to reunite Europe. Perhaps even tonight, uh, Putin is trying to do the same thing, re re make Europe a Russian, uh, his Russian prize here. Uh, there's some been talks of him moving on past uh, to the other countries if he uh, wins this. It's so here's some vain attempts to reunite Europe. And they were through marriages, alliances, and treaties. Men have vainly attempted to reunite the European continent. Leaders such as Charlemagne, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, Mussolini, and Hitler have fought to build a new European empire throughout history. Still, the words of scripture have stopped every single would-be ruler. Revelation 13 tells us that there will be another attempt to establish a universal kingdom of religion, not uh, not so much land as it, as it is religion. So you don't want to miss uh, Revelation 13. Still, Daniel's prophecy clearly states that the world would remain politically divided for the rest of Earth's history. So, uh, you know, Andy, you know there's... What, what, one of the things you said what was just really important was that we're going to defy, try to merge them with the seed of men, but yet that would keep them apart. At one time, all the kings, all the monarchy of Europe were related. Yes, yeah. it's, still, it's still that way. Yeah. If, if you they look tried at to, the, They try to unite it through marriage. And, yes. and as God, God said, that won't work. <laughs> and it didn't work. Right. If yeah. you look at uh, uh, photographs of some of the more modern 
kings and queens, princes of Europe, you notice that uh, they look alike. So if you, uh, what was the last ruler, Tsar Nicholas III? Tsar, Tsar Nicholas photographs and then compare them to British monarchy and you realize, yeah, they're cousins. Yeah. <laughs> they look alike. Right. Now, it would be, I appreciate you guys uh, bringing out those points. And I think, Larry, you'll get to talk a little bit more about this uh, when you get to Daniel 11. Yes. <laughs> a little more detail. Um, now, it doesn't end here with uh, this division of the Ten Toes. Um, Daniel goes on to say, and this is of the last two verses of the chapter, it says, in the days of these kings, now what kings? It's these kings, these countries that were divided for, out of Rome. The days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Folks, we're living in the days of these kings right now. It goes on to say, the kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Who do you think this rock is that smites the image? It's the Christ. Rock of ages, clap for me. Oh, Did I sing that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. We can bank on it that if God was able to predict all these other nations, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the divisions of the king, you can see that we're down here in the days of these kings. Jesus will come soon. Uh, no man knows the day or the hour, but we can know that it is near even at the door. And this is a good clue, right? Um, I thought plus, you might, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, plus the fact that the Pope is trying to get us all under one, all countries under one church. Yeah. The one church is the universal church that it's talking about in there. We know that yeah. that's coming too. We'll, we'll talk about some of that, perhaps, uh, as we move along. I thought you might enjoy this chart. Here's where the children of Israel were captive in 603 B.C. Babylon. The Medo-Persians, and this is historically accurate. You can look it up in uh, your history books. Uh, in 539 B.C., they, the Medes and Persians conquered Babylon. Greece came on the scene in 331 B.C., Rome in 168 BC, and Jesus was born in 4 BC. And then uh, Europe was divided in 476 AD. And we're now in what some people call the church era. The church started in Acts, the Christian church. And over the years of uh, this church has been gone through some tough times, the dark ages, and a lot of divisions and stuff that happens during this time. But at the end, this rock that cut without hands uh, refers to the second coming of Christ. I thought of these verses here to finish this off here. Uh, Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. This was Jesus talking about himself, falling upon him, uh, feeling conviction, and falling above him, you are broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder, just like the shaft that was blown into the wind. You can see here that the second coming of Christ, and I want to point this out as we move along, the second coming of Christ is a destructive event. And uh, again, as I say, we'll see that uh, more as we move along. I would ask you the question, have you fallen on the rock, on the stone, and been broken? Uh, there's time now before the Lord comes, uh, but one day that time will run out. 
These are actually the last verses of Daniel 2. I'm sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. It says, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel. Wow, was he impressed. And he commanded that they should be uh, present in an offering and incense them. He wanted to worship Daniel. And then the king answered Daniel and said, truly, your God is a God of gods, the Lord of of kings and a revealer of secrets since you could reveal this secret then the king promoted daniel and gave him many great gifts and uh, made him ruler over the whole province of babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of babylon so daniel got a great promotion not only him but also his friends also daniel petitioned the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So um, when the Lord comes, it says in Revelation 22 that he, he brings his reward with him. He will say, hopefully to all of us, well done, my faithful servant. I want to be one of those, don't you? Amen. Absolutely. What knowing God does for a person, when a person has evidence of God being who he is, they are happy and want to give good gifts. Increased faith, all those things come along. Uh, this prophecy of Daniel was shown in a simple and straightforward manner. Uh, as I mentioned last week and, and tonight, we will begin to see God's repeat and expand uh, that actually starts in chapter 7, but we're going to see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego show up next week in a fiery furnace, and Larry has that one. Um, these, uh, yeah. We're also going to see another great image. <laughs> yeah, we're going to see another great image. We are. In fact, yeah. I'm going to give a quick preview of next week. Sorry, Larry, I'm not yep, going to see your thunder. Uh, the king's pride will get to him. He goes into a state of denial. And what does he do? Instead of a head of gold, he makes the entire image gold. <laughs> and right. this ties in with uh, Revelation 13, verse 15, and Revelation 14, 8, which I'll um, read here. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. So there's going to be another image. It's an image of a beast. And we'll find out a beast represents a political power, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So just as there's a death decree in Daniel chapter 3, the big golden image, there will be something very similar at the end of time. And again, we'll see another angel uh, followed saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We'll learn what that means right here, but notice Babylon has fallen. This will be a symbolic Babylon, not a literal Babylon because it is gone. Um, the time is coming when a power symbolized by Babylon will have her heyday, but she will fall. The reason She's angered the God of heaven by forcing a uh, drink and the whole world to commit uh, this spiritual fornication. So when we arrive at the middle part of Revelation, we'll begin to understand what this means for our day. Two more slides here. Actually, one more. This is the last one. I love Psalms 47.7. For God is the king of all the earth, singing you praises with understanding. Can we say amen to that tonight? Amen. Definitely. Well, uh, I'm right at eight o'clock. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, they, you know, we, we rush through that a little bit so we can yeah. take questions uh, via email. If you want to write us at danielrevelation2300 at gmail.com if you have any questions between now and next week. Otherwise, we can answer some next week. And uh, Charlie, they can find the recording on our uh, YouTube site, which is called what? Um, metal or Rock. Now, can you <laughs> guess why I called it Metal or Rock? 
Yeah. Mm. The countries where metal and rock is Jesus, you'll have the either these towers or you'll your faith will be in Jesus. Yeah, I sort of thought saw this as a, a, a battle of systems. There's a system of man, which are all those metals, and then God has a system which is represented by the rock. Could be metal metal versus rock. <laughs> right. So so our YouTube channel is called Metal or Rock. If you need to just look up the YouTube channel and find it. But metal we'll be or posting rock. We'll be posting it uh, tonight, posting this later on tonight onto that channel. Well, I can see all of you now. I couldn't see you before. There's Jeff. Jeff, I'm glad you made it. I understood that you had a little trouble getting in. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I appreciate those, you guys. Let's have a quick word of prayer to end, and then we'll uh, end. Uh, Lord, what a pr pleasure it has been tonight to open your word and to feel your presence through um, the Holy Spirit. And to see how you are a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Uh, Lord, help us to have understanding and wisdom as we move along through these studies. And may you always be glorified in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good night, everyone. You guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Eddie. Good night. Good night. Thank, Good night. You, Good night. <laughs> thank you, Eddie. Bye. All right. God bless. Bye-bye.